Welcome. Good evening. Um, is this on? It's not like it's on. Okay. Uh, my name is Glenn Elliott, and um, I'll be speaking with you tonight. I'm chief psychiatrist and medical director here. And uh, just so for my curiosity, how many have heard me talk about medications before? Smattering. Okay. Um, you may. There will be a fair amount of redundancy. I wish I could tell you things have moved really swiftly since the last time we talked, but. Uh, it's been a while. We're going to be talking about um, specifically medications related to ADHD um, and um, what some of the options might be and when you might want to use them. Um, what are we going to talk about tonight? I want first, I want to make some broad observations about ADHD. Um, for again, for those who have heard this talk, those will not have changed much, unfortunately, um, but um, a, a little bit of a little bit of modeling, a little bit of. Um, remolding of some of the concepts. Um, then I want to talk about a model of using medications for those um, who are considering it or if you've already um, go started going down that route. And we'll talk about medication options, we'll talk about some common patterns that we see with children with ADHD. Uh, there's also some resources. All of, this, all of the slides that you're going to see are in your handout, um, and you're welcome to make notes on that and take it with you. Uh, there, there's also a um, larger uh, piece of paper that has all of the FDA endorsed medications for ADHD, um, and uh, that's important because I used to c include them in the slide set, and I decided this year not to do that to sort of shorten shorten that part. So, all right. So broad ob observations. Um, the um, point that I make to families over and over again, including my own, uh, for those who have heard me talk before, I have a uh, now fully grown son who uh, has, uh, at, meet him at 33, pretty significant inattentive ADHD. Fortunately, he's learned to cope with it pretty well, um, does use medications, which he didn't do when he was younger, but uh, does now as an adult. Um, and um, um, he and I have even presented together here and elsewhere uh, about sort of what it was like growing up with ADHD. Um, one of the points that, that, I, that I make is that uh, for many individuals, we know at least a third, probably closer to 40% uh, percent will have significant ADHD symptoms probably for their whole lives, certainly into middle, middle to late 20s, which is about as far as we studied it, but um, systematically. Um, although another third of individuals seem to outgrow it or more likely develop ways of coping with it so that it no longer becomes a impairing uh, difficulty. And then there are people who are, essentially everybody sort of gets better, but there are people who uh, continue to have symptoms, they're just not as severe as they used to be. Um, so the good news is that on average, over time, symptoms of ADHD become less severe. That's not going to feel that way week to week. <laughs> in the trenches when you're dealing with your kid. But when you, when you look, when you step back and look at studies that have now, and there are a number of studies that have followed children uh, from uh, seven, eight, nine up into adulthood. And um, although there are, of course, always exceptions, m almost all of the children uh, develop fewer symptoms uh, or less severe symptoms uh, over time. Um, and, um, so even if they're present, they're 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 not as obvious. They're not as instead of being hyperactive, they may be restless. Uh, instead of being impulsive, uh, to the degree that they get in trouble, they may they may still do things impulsively, but um, have a little more uh, ability to for self control. Um, the other good news is that really a remarkable variety of interventions are cl uh, clearly able to reduce symptoms, uh, at least in the short run. Um, while you're using them, um, and medications is just one of those. There are behavioral techniques which are have been shown to be as effective as, as medications. The difficulty is that so far all of the treatments that have been uh, shown to be efficacious in the short run seem to have no effect on the ADHD itself. What it's doing is reducing symptoms. So this is the equivalent of having cold medicine reduce your cold symptoms, but if you stop taking the cold medicines, if your cold is still there, you're still going to have symptoms. Um, and the other thing which we are increasingly aware of is that uh, so there are some features of ADHD that can be real strengths. Um, and particularly, uh, that turns out to be true as, as you um, grow uh, older uh, into your late teens and early 20s, partly because you then have more of an option of finding areas where uh, 
uh, being imp a bit impulsive, for example, may be uh, advantageous. Startup companies, for example, uh, in the area often um, uh, are quite fond of adults with, with uh, ADHD because they um, can live in a chaotic environment, create their own chaos in the process, but uh, can, can uh, actually be quite helpful in startup companies. Unfortunately, uh, as the companies mature, uh, many of those individuals don't necessarily um, fit into um, sort of the next phase of a growing company and may find themselves moving from startup to startup rather than being able to, to stick with one, one company. Uh, the bad news, as I already touched on, there is no treatment of which we're aware that has the, the ability to affect the long-term outcome of ADHD. That seems to be built in uh, for each individual. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Do you see any differences between the genders and symptoms getting better as they get no. older? I mean, there are lots of differences in the gender in terms of how common it is and that kind of stuff. And um, actually, Steve Henshaw has published a book uh, fairly recently where he uh, was describing outcomes for girls. And uh, there are some differences, not in ADHD so much as in the other kinds of problems that they have. Girls in general, and I hate generalizations, but nonetheless, this is the best we can do. In general, girls are more likely to have wh what we call internalizing problems, depression, anxiety, um, poor self-esteem, self-injurious behaviors, those kinds of things. Boys tend to go the other direction and have externalizing behaviors, uh, breaking rules, taking risks, um, jumping off high, uh, high places without necessarily checking first where they're landing, things like that. Um, but um, there are huge differences, and we'll talk about that in a minute, there are huge differences in, in how common particular types of ADHD are across genders. But if you are a girl with combined type ADHD, you're pr pretty much indistinguishable in terms of your behaviors and response to medicines and all of that kind of thing. Um, okay, um, one of the important points that um, is easy to forget, particularly if you, you really don't want to put your child on medication, is that um, if, if you pause to think about what kids need to accomplish in the years between six and 16, uh, it is mind boggling. Um, and um, what we know is that having ADHD symptoms doesn't help with any of those other tasks. Um, so an, an argument uh, that I think has some validity to it is even though we're not fixing the, the ADHD itself, what we, what we are doing, um, uh, and this is actually backed up by research, is making it possible for them to potentially develop in uh, are other areas where they would not otherwise be able to, um, uh, to develop, which in can include peer friendships, can include uh, scholastic achievement, um, um, sense of self-worth, ability to start developing other skills, that for those kinds of those kinds of issues. Um, so not treating ADHD at least runs the risk of making all of those things harder. It doesn't prevent it. Um, also, if you've got, which often happens, again, I'll show you a slide in a little bit, um, if you've got only about a third of kids with ADHD have just ADHD, the other two-thirds have at least one and sometimes as many as three, four, and five other diagnoses. And um, many of those are not medication responsive. So you may have a child with dyslexia plus ADHD. Uh, probably this was most striking to me years ago uh, when I was up at UCSF, I ended up collaborating with the Center on Deafness up there. And that is a particularly bad combination, being deaf and having ADHD, because if you're deaf, the only way you learn is to be watching whoever's trying to communicate with you, and ADHD kids are not famous for that. <laughs> so um, so that's one of the things that we sort of think about is are there, and in fact, um, I was involved in a study called the MTA, the Multimodal Treatment of ADHD, and um, um, I'll show you that it'll, that's actually the slide that looks at sort of the other disorders that we have. One of the encouraging things that we found is in directly treating the ADHD, which was the focus of that study, we indirectly uh, improved many of the other disorders that kids had as well. Um, uh, unfortunately, again, so at times when their ADHD got out of control again, some of those other disorders sort of reappeared as well. 
Um, so th there's a there's a fellow um, deservedly famous called Sir Michael Rudder uh, in England, who was really the father of psych child psychiatry in England, and uh, he created the very modestly named Rudder scale, um, which simply counts up the number of diagnoses that you have, and it turns out that. Um, uh, that's not a linear f sort of function. Uh, it, it's, it's what's called exponential. So the more diagnoses you have, the more likely things are to not turn out well for you. Um, so these kids that have four and five diagnoses are really at risk for not doing well. And the more of those that we can sort of peel away so that they've got fewer diagnoses, uh, the more likely they are to be able to, uh, to succeed. Uh, the other thing I really want to point out, uh, because I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, things other than medication, but if anybody tells you that they have a treatment that is 100% effective and has zero side effects, uh, my best suggestion to you is to hold on to wherever your money is and back away slowly, uh, nodding, nodding yes if you wish, um, but there is no such thing as a totally safe treatment that is also totally effective. Um, fortunately, it isn't necessarily directly proportional. There are treatments that have relatively few side effects um, and relatively large benefit, and unfortunately the other way as well, the relatively few benefits and sometimes large side effects. But um, no treatment, behavioral medication, natural substances you can buy on the web, uh, none of them are both effective and risk-free. Um, and somebody can show me otherwise. I'll be happy to. I'll be happy to be contradicted. But um, that's been my experience. So um, the idea that ADHD is a chronic disorder, if you're a parent, particularly of a relatively young kid, this is really something you have to put your wrap your head around because um, this is long distance. This is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and um, how this is going to present, exactly what's going to show up over time is going to change. So you may think, gosh, we've got this licked, we know exactly what we're doing, and then um, lo and behold, a whole new set of expectations happen and new problems emerge. So every so often you may have to sort of reassess, uh, is what we're doing really helping? Um, and can we do, do we need to do more and what, what's, what's getting in the way? So part of the problem, and I, I probably should have drawn this in a, in a uh, slide, and I don't, never thought to do so, um, but I, I've me already mentioned ADHD gets better over time. At the same time, social expectations are increasing over time, and usually people come to see pe folk like me when those two lines cross, when social expectations exceed whatever, uh, wherever the child is developmentally. That can happen as young as age three. It may happen as late as age 12 or 13 or even later. Um, and um, may take on different forms over time. But it, it's, it's, I guess the reason I've never drawn it is because it's too complicated to really try to draw. But it's kind of a crisscross. So uh, social expectations sometimes take a dramatic increases uh, the difference between third and fourth grade, for example, and fourth and fifth grade are really pretty, pretty dramatic. And many kids with ADHD, that that's a that becomes a real problem because they're expected to begin to organize for themselves, and they're just not able to do that. Um, and um, that that issue is one as a parent we need to, we need to watch and 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 try to jump jump in. Um, uh, appropriately when, when we feel like our kid is at one of those crossroads where the expectations uh, just simply don't match um, the ca capabilities. Also, impairment can take a variety of forms, um, and some of them are more obvious than others. Um, one of the things uh, my son and I now have done um, or talk about what we call growing up ADHD four or five times, and it's been a real education for me because there were things that were going on in his childhood of which I was completely unaware in terms of, for example, his sort of sense of detachment from other kids. He looked like he had plenty of friends and was doing great in that area, but always felt a little different, a little removed, and a little lonely, um, which is an area that I didn't even know to address with him because he seemed to be doing just fine. Um, so um, in response to that, 
having an array of interventions, some of them related to medication, but also many of them related to non-medication kind of strategies can be really key uh, in trying to make sure that your child is able to succeed at whatever stage of life uh, there is. Uh, for, for most kids, um, when we're talking children and teens, one of the key environments over which we as parents have uh, distressingly little control is school. Uh, my, my colleague Steve Henshaw likes to say if you just wanted to visualize a, an environment in which all of the weaknesses of ADHD were brought out uh, beautifully, it would, you'd be hard pressed to come up with something better than school. Um, uh, it's, it's almost like a, a marriage made in somewhere other than heaven. Um, you have to sit still, you have to pay attention, you have to not be distracted by all of the things going on around you, you have to pretend to be interested in things you're not in the least bit interested in, um, and, and that's, that's if you don't have ADHD, um, so you can imagine. Um, so onward and upward. So if you think about, th this is a thought slide that I made some years ago actually around autism, but it applies equally well to uh, um, ADHD and actually most most disorders, uh, both medical medical or, or physical and, and, and psychiatric. Um, if you think about where we can intervene, there are only sort of three broad areas over which we have um, the potential for control. A very important one with, with ADHD, which we're not going to talk about tonight, is environmental. Getting kids in the right kind of structure with the right kind of support um, and um, the right kind of, of programmatic expectations can make an enormous difference. And this has actually been systematically shown um, with uh, several researchers who have uh, demonstrated that they can create environments in which kids off medications can do at least as well as kids on medications and perhaps even better. The difficulty is that when you take the environment away, the improvement disappears. But it, it, it's an important area to pay attention to. Um, psychological is cognitive behavioral or intrapsychic. Um, intrapsychic, in my experience, that is things, you know, sort of paying attention to your feelings and emotions and what we use, what we call psychodynamic therapy, uh, is not particularly useful for ADHD per se, but can be very helpful, for example, with kids who develop self esteem problems, who wonder why everybody hates them and why they don't have any friends and don't ever get invited to birthday parties because the last time they fell on the cake and open the presents and <laughs> don't, they can't figure out how that can anyway be involved with. Uh, anyway, those kinds of issues sometimes can be a uh, uh, call for um, psychotherapy in, in the tr old traditional sense. Cognitive behavioral therapy is really more structured around um, sort of how you think and what you should be doing and how you connect your behavior to consequences. With younger kids, that's mostly directed towards parents um, and help the parents helping create a protective environment that, that has clear expectations and consequences and all of those kinds of things. As kids get into their mm, early teens, 12, 13, 14, um, if they're interested and if they wish to, cognitive behavioral therapy sometimes can be helpful in helping them sort of sort through what's happening um, with their ADHD and how they can sort of help make sure that they're less impaired by it. Uh, and it can be can be useful. Uh -huh. Of course. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned 12 to 13. Are you also intending to say that behavioral therapies don't tend to work if they're younger? In general, trying to teach an eight-year-old with severe ADHD not to do that um, is not going to be very effective. Um, behaviorists were very enthused um, and have been involved in treating ADHD since um, um, the early mid 70s, and initially uh, they had these lovely things like red, red, yellow, green light kinds of things, and the average IQ ADHD child can learn those techniques very, very well quickly, and recite them back to you without any problem, and the next time an impulsive urge happens, they give in to the impulsive urge, and when they're asked, why in the world did you do that, they said, I forgot. Um, um, so yeah, there is a level, there, there's, there's a point at which kids develop the ability to sort of compare themselves to other 
kids and are interested in making that change. And when that, when they get to that point, potentially this, the, these kinds of techniques can be helpful. But the, the, the key is it has to be something the kid really wants to help work with because it's unlike pills where you can sort of persuade them to take it whether they really want to or not, Behavioral therapy works if you're willing to do the work, and that sometimes is pretty strenuous. Yes, ma'am. Um, with the cognitive behavioral therapy, is it effective even for other disorders, like say autism or anything else? No, cognitive behavioral therapies are used for enormous. Like, well, but is it not effective until they're 12 um, for every, across the board, or is it? Maybe ADHD is a little worse. Anxious kids probably are a little more uh, able to, to uh, partly the techniques are different. Uh, I mean, it's, it's one thing to notice that I'm breathing really rapidly and I need to stop stop that. I mean, the problem with ADHD, one of the many issues with ADHD, particularly the so-called combined type, is that the, the distance between thought and, and action is markedly shortened. Um, so whatever you teach them, the likelihood that it's going to intrude um, is, is lower. So if you get an anxious kid who doesn't want to do anything to begin with, <laughs> It, it's, uh, or is you know, scared of the consequences, it, it's a little easier to sort of teach them ways to, to deal with that. In fact, what one of the interesting problems we sometimes have is that kids with ADHD also may have anxiety, and if we treat their anxiety, sometimes their behavior gets worse because that was the only thing holding them back. <laughs> uh, um, okay, but we're not talking about that today. So, so the other are biologic interventions and there are two sort of broad categories one are nutritional changes and I know you all would love for me to spend three hours talking about that I'm not going to uh, and the other is medications which is um, what I what I do for a living um, nutritional changes uh, particularly in very young kids there is evidence that it can be helpful again the problem is is it's helpful as long as you sort of maintain it and one of the issues, or there are two issues. One is that the evidence seems to suggest that as kids get older, the impact of the nutritional changes is, is less robust anyway. And the other is if you really think that your eight or nine year old child is eating what you put in his or her lunch box every day, um, we can talk later. Um, okay. So uh, this is a little hard to see, I apologize. This actually um, ended up getting published in the Washington Post uh, a few years ago. Um, I helped uh, create it along with um, a colleague of mine down south, uh, Steve Stahl. Um, and um, I apologize for the complexity. It, it's, uh, it's sort of good news, bad news. We actually are making progress in understanding which part of the brains are involved in ADHD and which aspects of ADHD um, and it, it's turning out to be way, way more complicated than uh, when I started in the field back in the 80s. Um, and we also are beginning to be able to disentangle um, things that are specific to ADHD, both inattention and hyperactivity and impulsivity, uh, from another area that we won't have much time to talk about today, which is executive functioning, which is not universally a problem with kids with ADHD, but seems to be more likely to, to uh, be a problem with that group than with many others. And often in adolescence is really what gets, gets proves to be really, really difficult. Um, uh, executive functioning has to do with, I, I use this example because I can't, uh, imagine that you're a gourmet cook and you have a seven course meal and you manage to get all of the things that are supposed to be cold on the table when they're supposed to when they're cold and all of the warm things are supposed to be hot or hot when they get on the table. That kind of planning, kids with ADHD are not particularly good at anyway, but kids with ADHD and executive functioning, it's really, really difficult. And by the time you get to high school, that kind of ability to prioritize among five different teachers, all of who want your attention and are going to push you to do this, that, and the other, um, um, e even, uh, I mean this actually tends to show up in fourth and fifth grade when the schools begin doing uh, projects that are multi-step, four or five steps. Um, and kids with ADHD often have an enormous amount of trouble even with, with that level of, of uh, organization and require a lot of external support. Unfortunately, so far at least, we haven't found any medications that help in that area. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that a little more later. But we do have, again, some information. The, the the um, imaging techniques that are becoming available 
are really making pro allowing us to make some significant progress in sort of defining what parts of the brain and where the pathways are uh, with some of these um, kinds of, of difficulties. Um, less successful so far has been figuring out exactly which neurochemicals and neuroregulators are involved in these various um, uh, pathways and how to make changes in them that, that uh, hopefully uh, make, make improvements. Um, for ADHD, there's, there's, a, there's something called the, the substantia nigra and basal ganglia sort of right in the middle, which is involved in the reward system. That's where dopamine is a very important neuroregulator, and we believe that a lot of um, the benefits from the stimulant uh, comes from uh, increasing uh, the activity in that particular area. Um, we still, there's still a lot of what we don't know is about that, but, but um, and there's some other compounds that aren't related to dopamine that also seem to be beneficial. But um, the, um, what, what is interesting is there have been some nice studies that have shown that kids with ADHD that are off medication, the activity level uh, in this area looks different from kids without ADHD, and when you give them stimulants, uh, that difference goes away and they look much more like kids who don't have ADHD. And that's transient. When you take the stimulants away, the, um, the activity level looks, goes back to what it was before. Okay. Um, it, it, it's, it's a lower, lower activity, and, it, and, and the dopamine tends to increase the activity level in that area. All right. So uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, um, but it's important if you are going to go with medication or if you are with medication that you feel like you've got somebody you can talk to um, and don't be embarrassed if you feel like things aren't going well. Um, uh, I can't, I, one, one of the things that drives me slightly batty is I have a number of friends who are, have no compunction whatsoever calling me and telling them how things are not going well with them, not about their ADHD, but almost about anything. And I say, well, why don't you call your doctor? And the answer is inevitably, well, I don't want to bother him or her. Uh, <laughs> um, to which I say, well, I'm not bothered, but I may not have the answer. Besides that, I can't do anything. So probably going to need to go talk to your doctor. Um, y particularly early in treatment, you need to plan to meet fairly regularly. That doesn't mean daily, but uh, at least every week or two. Um, and certainly, uh, as things get, you know, things begin to get better, you can cut down to maybe once a month. Um, the, the the MTA that I mentioned before, the multimodal treatment of ADHD, that was one of the elements that we had in the medication treatment uh, was that we met monthly with uh, with each child and parent, and we actually got feedback not only from the parent but also from the teacher about how the child was doing, and we made decisions about medications based on that information. Um, if you're beginning, if you're new to all of this and beginning to think about it, it's important to ask about likely side effects. Uh, what targets are you hoping for? Uh, the two targets that people often ask me for that I have to sadly tell them I don't have medicines for are one, I want my kids to have friends. <laughs> I wish I had a medicine like that, I don't. Uh, and two, I want my kid to be happy. Um, and I don't have one for that either. Um, but we do have medicines that I, you know, I, I, I want my kid not to be yelled at by the teacher because he's interrupting in class all the time. That, that's a target I can, I can deal with. What field of medicine should the prescriber be in? Um, um, it partly depends on the severity of, uh, and, and responsiveness of the child. Um, there are way, way, way more pediatricians than there are uh, child psychiatrists. There are three groups of, of specialties uh, that l are likely to feel comfortable prescribing ADHD medications. Most pediatricians, but not by no means all, there are some pediatricians who basically just won't. Uh, developmental behavioral pedi pediatricians, which is, I think, slightly smaller in, in size in terms of number of, of practitioners uh, than child psychiatry and then child psychiatrists. Um, um, the models are somewhat different. Um, if you've got a kid who responds beautifully to medications, pediatricians can be perfect because um, they're used to five-minute visits. Um, you, know, you go in, they get weighed and checked, height checked, and um, they're out and you're done and everything's happy. If things are not working so well, then moving to a behavioral uh, developmental pediatrician or to a child and adolescent psychiatrist probably makes sense. Um, sometimes we actually go the reverse. We get things stabilized and then we move them back to pediatrics. 
Um, I think more as important is somebody who is going to be able to listen to you and tell you, you know, this is over my head. We we need you know we need to do something else. Yeah. My daughter's twenty, and I'm wondering if we need to have her assess for this in college. And so, what kind of person would we be looking for? Uh, so adults with ADHD is a, a, a field that emerged about 15 years ago, maybe even 20, uh, and has really taken off, um, uh, although not so much locally as, as on the East Coast. Um, but uh, there are adult psychiatrists who specialize in it. Is she local or New York? Um, actually, uh, there's a Hallowell Clinic in New York, uh, which would be fine. Um, I think he, he would be um, very... Uh, his his P you probably won't meet him personally because I, I think he's like electron as far as I can tell he's never actually in any one place at any given time, but um, but he's got a Boston here and New York uh, he has he has sites. So quick question now trying not to be the person that we were talking about <coughs> no specifics here so as far as the dosage goes obviously it depends on the weight and the age but they it's a trend that you kind of administer a very low dosage how it works and then improve on it. Is that the general trend? Yes. Um, particularly with, with drug naive kids kids who haven't been on medicine before, it, my, I usually try to get a drug a me medication dose that I am positive will have no effect whatsoever. So if it has an effect, it probably isn't the medication. Uh, and um, uh, the difficulty is is that, that, that particularly with the stimulants, it turns out that size doesn't matter. <laughs> um, that there are some very huge individuals who turn out to have beautiful responses to quite low doses of stimulants. There are some very small individuals who end up needing uh, what seem like impossibly large amounts, and you, you really just have to sort of do it. Once you find a medicine that works, typically that medicine will continue to work, and if you have to increase it, it's because they get bigger with time, and then you sort of have to keep up with their size. But, but one of the reasons that we believe stimulants are really doing something very specific is that unlike their abuse kinds of things of giving you a high and those kind of things, which require higher and higher doses to maintain, the ADHD benefit once you once you get there um, seems to stay. It's not like uh, you develop tolerance right. and then the doctor has to exactly. Yes. Do you believe in increasing the dosage in until you yes. can hit the side effects, and then you figure out okay, maybe we go back down to a smaller dose or. I mean, it really, again, it depends a little bit, but if you've got a kid who's, if parents believe and teachers believe that this kid is no longer showing ADHD symptoms that are causing trouble, I'm happy to stop. <laughs> um, if, um, if, if we aren't quite sure, it's, it's reasonable to raise it a little bit. Uh, I sometimes compare it to toast. Uh, you keep lengthening the time until it's burnt and then you back off a little. Uh, in this case, burnt means some, some level of side effect that you're not happy with. Um, but there are some kids where literally, you know, five milligrams and nobody has any complaints anymore and I don't see any reason to go any higher than that. Uh, uh, there are other kids where, where you really do have to ramp up. Um, uh, we did a, with the MTA, we actually did this very fancy study where we uh, blindly every day the child was on a different dose of, of stimulant. You can get away with that with stimulants because each morning it's out of your system and it's as if you had, didn't have it the day before. Um, and we ended up um, exposing them to four different doses including placebo um, and were able to then sort of decide what their optimal dose was. And we had different kinds of response curves. There were some kids who showed a very clear best response and then above that things didn't work so well either because of side effects or because the, the they were showing less benefit. Uh, other kids, uh, actually the highest dose we used didn't do any good um, and other kids, you know, um, had sort of a st steady state and it didn't matter which dose you gave so we, we you know, we tend to, to give them the lowest dose we can get away with. Um, so it, it is, that that part does require some interactions with with the doc it doesn't necessarily mean a face to face every time, but interactions, what's going on, and not only with the benefits, but what are the side effects, and, and you know, and we'll, we'll talk about those. Um, agreeing on useful positive targets is really worthwhile because that, that sort of helps give you a benchmark of are, are we doing any good. Um, we just really talked about how best um, 
uh, how to determine what the best dose is going to be, and then what kind of monitoring is needed. The things we know about are uh, there's for most individuals there's some effect on appetite, which can range from mild to quite profound. There's some effect on height, which again can range from mild to none to to quite profound. And there's usually an effect on sleep, um, as in getting getting to sleep can become more difficult. So those are the three things that we m monitor most commonly. And then there's some other side effects which we can maybe touch on later. What we know is that particularly the first year, kids uh, on average, well, actually we discovered two things, one of which uh, both one of which was a real surprise. If kids, uh, in, in our particular study, we had an arm that was uh, behavior only, so they had no medications whatsoever. And what we found is that compared to normal controls, those kids were actually taller than the non-ADHD kids. Um, kids who were on medication, their rate of growth decreased. Um, and on average, the first year, they lost about half an inch compared to what they, compared to kids with ADHD who are not on medication. Um, uh, we started seven through nine was, was our group. No, age, age seven through nine. Yeah. Is what you're talking about, about meds applicable to whatever age? As, as far as we know, I mean, the, the best research we have available is individuals well diagnosed with ADHD regardless of age respond similarly to the medications that we currently have available. We need to worry much less about height, for example, if you're 20 than if you're nine. Um, so there are some things that we, uh, that, you know, we don't worry as much about. But, uh, but yes, the, the medicines seem to work. Uh, it's sort of the miraculous thing is um, the medicines seem to work in adults as well as they do in kids uh, because the effect on kids is really ir irrespective of whether you have ADHD or not. So any child, given a stimulant will respond in a very similar fashion. They, they, they become less physically active, they become more focused, um, and if they've got impulsivity, they become less Im impulsive. Somewhere, and we don't know exactly where during adolescence, that begins to change, and what they don't get, what children don't get is a high with, with stimulants. So n I've never had an eight-year-old say, wow, that really feels good. <laughs> I want another hit, um, which is a good thing. We don't want that. Yeah. So the height, um, height correlation, is that related to the lack of appetite? No. Mm -hmm. Turn, turns out that they're really separate. Um, uh, what, what weight relates to is caloric intake, um, and that's a very close relationship, and um, kids with taking stimulants often don't want to eat. Um, and we'll, we'll t if we get there, we'll talk about that. Uh, with height, it's probably related to, to growth hormone. Uh, it turns out one of the things that dopamine does, I mentioned it's sort of in the middle of the brain, it actually is right next to the pituitary and it drips dopamine onto the pituitary. And um, um, the, we think it, it, we, it has a so-called inhibitory effect. So, we, so we, we think kids with ADHD, the reason they're taller is because dopamine is not inhibiting the pituitary as much. Um, and when we start adding stimulants, that adds more dopamine, and we think that's that's why they're shorter. But the, the exact details of that remain to be identified. So we think dopamine activity is lower in unmedicated kids with ADHD. So that we think that's why they're taller than average. When we add in dopamine, a dopamine agonist. Uh, an agent that's going to increase dopamine activity that inhibits some aspects of the pituitary, and we think that's we think that's why growth gets shortened. Um, they might eat much less. Much well, and again, this really depends. I, I've had kids who have no effect whatsoever, and I've had kids where their appetite is really. Just completely gone. Yeah. I feel like my son's getting even feed more than before. <laughs> wow. So anything is possible, but it, it, it's it's that's that's not a common problem. Yeah, yeah. It, it, the uh, I'm, having been obese most of my life, uh, one of the things I, I have a fascination for obesity. Uh, one of the fascinating things about individuals who are obese is that their appetite is not 
regulated by whether they're hungry. It's whether there's food available. <laughs> it's a visual thing. Um, and um, that may be why kids who are way overweight already may have less of an effect. Um, one of the things that we just learned through the MTA, we've been following these kids now. They're into their mid-20s at this point. But um, one of the th completely unexpected things is when they get to their late teens, it turns out that, if, again, if we compare kids who have never been on medication versus kids who um, have been on medication this whole period of time, um, the, the kids on medication actually, when they're in their late teens, are at increased risk for obesity. Um, and we don't completely understand why that is, but it may be that the appetite suppressant effects have, be, have worn off, essentially, and kids are so used to being able to eat whenever they want to uh, that, that they, they end up not having the self-regulatory mechanisms that the other kids have. All right. From a point of view of being a doctor, um, particularly a doctor who does psychoactive medications, stimulants are probably the most gratifying of all of the medications we've got for two reasons. One is that they work essentially 20 minutes after you give them. Uh, so literally with my residents, I try to encourage them to take a kid who responds well to medication, bring him or her in off medication in the morning, have them take the pill at the beginning of the session, and see what things are like half an hour later. Um, um, the other is is that 65% of the time, whichever stimulant you pick is going to work well and have adequate tolerable side effects. Um, I do not believe we have another medication and for any disorder that has that kind of a response rate. More than that, uh, there are two broad classes of stimulants. There's amphetamine and methylphenidate. Uh, there's a study that was done in the 70s that showed that if you randomly gave kids either amphetamine or methylphenidate to begin with, 65% of them did well with that medication. If they didn't do well or they had side effects that were unacceptable and you switched to the other one, another 15 to 20% did well with the other class of stimulant. So ultimately, we're talking about roughly 80 to 85% of individuals with ADHD will find a stimulant that has benefit. Um, I do not believe we have anything close to that with any other uh, disorder. And then in addition to that, there are some other non-stimulant medications we can use that tack on about another 5% uh, to, to that. If they don't do well with stimulants, we can, we can add, add one of those. Um, so roughly, we think 85 to 90% of kids with ADHD are going to do well with medication and tolerate it. Have side, they may have side effects, but they're not so bad that we feel we need to stop. Um, the other nice thing about stimulants is that, as I said, they work essentially 20 minutes after you give them. Um, for better or worse, they wear off at the end of the day. Starting the next day is a whole, whole new experience. Um, but that means that if you've got a child where most of your concerns are school-related, you can choose to use the medications during school days and skip weekends and, and or you know if you've got some special occasion you may want to use it on a weekend but largely skip weekend and holidays maybe get a summer holiday and most of the side effects on appetite and certainly weight and height turn out to be related to the total dose during the year so if one is able to decrease uh, the the total dosing uh, that decreases the likelihood of a long-term side effect yeah questions. One, if you suddenly stop the stimulants, does that produce suicidal ideation and things like that? Because that's one of the things you constantly see in the quick speed. You know, suddenly stopping this medication may, may cause suicidal thoughts. Uh, with stimulants, the answer is, I mean, th there's never a complete no. Might there be a, a kid like that? Maybe. But the vast majority, I've never met one, uh, the vast majority of do not have that experience. Um, they sometimes, if they've had a long weekend, um, you sort of have to start at a slightly lower dose because they're sort of not used to the higher dose um, uh, for a day or two and then go back to, to the higher dose. Most kids, you can keep them off for the weekend or even you know a week of, of school holiday, put them back on when school starts again and they do just fine. Taking them off is not gonna cause any problems. Um, uh, certainly, uh, becoming abruptly suicidal is a very unlikely phenomenon. If that did, 
that you'd have an abruptly suicidal kid every evening because the medicine is out of your system basically by, by late afternoon, early evening. The rest of the world is still using mostly short-acting uh, stimulants, that is, one, ones that have to be given two or three times a day. Uh, in the United States, we mostly use long-acting forms. Uh, those are listed in that big handout I've given you. Um, and they mostly vary sort of how long a day you want. Um, the latest one that came out, which I so far I've really not imagined wanting to use, lasts uh, 16 hours. Um, um, it's, a, uh, it's a form of amphetamine um, with sort of three, three an immediate release, a sort of release in the middle of the day and then a release a little later in the, the afternoon. Uh, most of these last somewhere between six to ten hours, and uh, as kids get older, as kids have different demands, um, you can sort of choose among them. Uh, they're all either methylphenidate or amphetamine, but um, but but how they're packaged and how they get delivered varies, and that can make a difference. All right. And it also is really important to sort of ask who's going to pay attention both to benefits and adverse effects. That's especially true if you've got a, uh, you know, two parents or four parents or however many parents kids or kids may have um, who disagree about whether the kids should be on medicine. How do you make you know sort of decide what's beneficial and what's not? Um, teachers are obviously very important since they uh, are the ones who see the kid during the day when stimulants are most active. Um, at daycare may be important as well. Asking the child is a mixed blessing. There are some kids who are exceedingly aware of what's going on with them and can be very helpful. There are other kids who turn from whirling dervishes to well-behaved, uh, studious in young individuals and insist that they are no different. Um, uh, they are not likely to be very helpful in telling you whether the medicine is making a difference or not. But they can may perhaps admit, if they are willing to do so, that they don't actually eat lunch. They give, give it away for something else or those kind of things. Um, all right. Um, so what we discovered with the MTA is that what doesn't typically happen with many pediatricians, although it can, and there's, there's some interesting programs that are uh, apps that are beginning to be available that may really make this much easier, is uh, that, that it's very, very helpful to have teacher input as well as parent input. And um, getting that can be tricky at times. Um, and at the moment, is still sort of up to the parents because um, most, most doctors um, really don't have time in their schedule to, to try to track down a teacher. Um, but, um, you know, sort of sharing with te teachers can be extraordinarily useful uh, as sort of neutral observers because you can tell them we're going to be trying some things. We, we would really like you to sort of let us know if you notice any difference and not necessarily tell them when you started the medicine or, or you know, when you changed the dose, uh, but give them something where they can give you regular feedback. Uh, and ask them in advance, like you've asked yourself, what, what is it that would make my child a better student in your classroom? Um, and try to keep that as simple as possible. I, you can spend lots of money on, on questionnaires, most of which are way too long for any teacher to fill out, or you can make your own little questionnaire with a, a little five-point, uh, you know, horrible to excellent uh, kind of thing, and it w the latter works just fine and is much more likely to get filled out. Um, the other thing, particularly as kids get older uh, and begin to develop homework and that sort of stuff, is to try to make sure that you've got a reliable source of information about upcoming so assignments and whether work is actually getting turned in. One of my frustrations with my son is, um, particularly when he hit middle school, um, none of it, it was just a black hole. Um, um, he, he was not severely enough affected that, that we could do a 504 or any kind of a specific plan, um, and teachers varied enormously. He actually had very little interest anyway, um, and I swear when he graduated from high school, which amazed me, um, we found stuff from eighth and ninth grade in the bottom of his backpack. And, uh, you, you can argue that you know, that's parental neglect as well as, as child, uh, but... Uh, but um, it, most schools now have online sort of things where you can, you can get that information. Um, trying to diminish areas of battle when you can is really important. So if, a, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of schools don't even have lockers anymore, but, but if, if the problem is, is that you know, books get left at school and you can't do the, and you can afford to have two books, have two books, um, whatever you can do. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
Do you happen to know either where the law stands or maybe if school districts have policies on what we are required as parents to tell them? Do we have to let them know? No, there is no law that requires you to tell teachers anything. In general, I recommend it because I would rather have teachers as allies rather than as um, somebody scratching their head about why you're such a bad parent that your child is so misbehaving so so horribly. Um, but um, but no, there's no there's no law requiring you to. Um, right. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm really not meaning to be glib about that. I think teachers can be really, I mean, unfortunately there are teachers, I, my, my favorite memory is we were sending a Connors questionnaire out when we were doing an assessment and the teacher very nicely wrote at the top, even though she had complained bitterly about this patient, patient and in fact that was one of the reasons that we were seeing him, she basically said, I do not believe in ADHD and I will not help you make that diagnosis and put zeros on all of the scales. But at least she was open about, I mean, why she bothered filling it out is beyond me, but uh, that may be her, her neurosis. But anyway, um, um, uh, there are teachers who don't believe in ADHD, and that can be difficult. Uh, but uh, there are relatively easy accommodations that teachers can make. Um, one of the, the, particularly if your child is prone to impulsive aggressive kind of behaviors, uh, one of the things that um, Steve Henshaw demonstrated some years ago um, and uh, he had a summer camp for kids with ADHD. And um, one of the, his questions was, how do reputations get established? And it turns out, basically, the first week of behavior establishes your reputation pretty much for the rest of the year. And if you've got a kid who's off medication and who impulsively slugs another kid, that's not a great start to, um, uh, to the um, uh, school year. And his recommendation, which I completely endorse, is that if you've got a kid that you know responds to medication and you'd like to see whether he still needs it, start the school year off with the medication, let the teacher get a chance to sort of get to know your child the way you know him or her, and then potentially using the teacher as an ally, say we'd like to sort of see whether he still needs this much medicine or you know, maybe a different medicine, and, and then do a trial with that sort of goodwill built up rather than absent. Yes, ma'am. What are your thoughts on starting a process for evaluation for a final floor plan for your child, especially if they're learning difficulties and getting special? All right, so the difficulty I have is that's a whole nother lecture and I have many thoughts about it, but I don't, I don't, that's not what today, tonight's about. We actually do have, and if it hasn't happened already, we do actually have school, a lecture on school accommodations. Um, it may have already occurred, but, but it looks like I'm being recorded, so maybe we can find it on the on our website. Okay, thank you. So it's encouraging to hear that these stimulants help children at school. One of my concerns is I have a very athletic son, mm -hmm. and I have seen children on the baseball field who are obviously meditated, and their gift, their God-given gift for athletic prowess has been severely affected. Hmm. If you track the, the effect of these drugs on their athletic ability. You should track anything that you feel is relevant. Have you had parents tell you? Actually, normally it's been the opposite. Um, uh, that, um, in fact, there's a very famous, uh, one of the early child and adolescent psychopharmacologists named Denny Cantwell down at UCLA, who as a uh, um, hobby, was a coach for kids with ADHD playing soccer. Uh, and he loved to describe the difference between a group of kids off medication on the field versus a group of kids on medication on the field. So um, there may be, I mean, it really probably depends in part on what the, what the, um, uh, the sport is. Uh, but in general, uh, I wouldn't expect stimulants to uh, we'd have to talk about exactly what you feel is different. But I would view that as a valid concern. If you feel like your child previously could do something that he or she now can't do, that's something that's worth talking to your psychiatrist about, about can we find something else that doesn't do that? Because uh, that shouldn't, I mean, that that's as bad as, as, as it wears off, they're suddenly having temper tantrums every afternoon. I mean, those are side effects that we need to deal with. Um, I strongly, even though doctors typically do and certainly should have records. They're not always easy to obtain. I strongly urge you to 
uh, if, if there's a if, if one parent or the other has an obsessive bone in their body, um, keep records, keep track of what medications your child's been on, what doses they've been on, what good and bad things you, you think have occurred, what their height and weight are. Uh, usually doctors are more than happy to give uh, growth charts out, and if not, you can get them on the web uh, very easily. Um, and any other changes that you think are relevant, such as, you know, my kid used to be a star in whatever sport and isn't any longer, uh, I would see as very relevant. Or my kid used to be more outgoing and isn't, uh, isn't as much. Sometimes it can be a little tricky, but whether it's a side effect or whether it's, it's the result of effective treatment. So uh, if you've got a kid who is um, uh, the uh, class clown and, and has, a, has a lovely sense of humor that sometimes gets them into trouble, um, and that sense of humor dies down when they become less impulsive, uh, that can be a side effect. Um, they, we inelegantly sometimes these kids are called th there's kind of a zombification that occurs where they just they're th they seem much flatter and much less responsive than they were before as far as again I'm, again as far as I'm concerned that's an unacceptable side effect and we need to think about something else but other times it's they are ne they know they've got a better sense of what they should be doing when they should be doing it and, and let they're less intrusive so you have to sort of disentangle that um, but I recommend that you keep your own records uh, and ask, ask doctors for, for you know, anything that you, that you might need for that. Um, the other thing is that doctors, much as we'd like to be, are not mind readers. So if you are concerned about things, you need to let them know. Uh, if you feel like things are benef benefits are fading, if you feel like there's new challenges, if, you, if your kid's undergone a sudden growth spurt and suddenly the medicine doesn't seem to be working as well. Uh, I had one parent call me recently uh, had been on a particular stimulant, had been doing beautifully, called up in a panic because suddenly it just was not working at all. Um, and um, in a fit of inspiration, I had her call the pharmacy and it turned out that they had changed, uh, they were using generic and they had changed which form of generic they, w they were using and it turned out one generic in that particular case was not as good as another, the other generic. We got her back on the previous medicine and she, she did fine. Um, um, so if there's a sudden change or if there's a change over time, let your doctor know so that he or she can be helpful. Uh, um, and and if, if, the, if you just feel like something's not working right, whatever it is, um, that, that, that's well worth talking about. Um, don't make major changes during transitions. If your kid's about to face a major school test or finals or something like that, uh, wait until after those things are done um, uh, before you before you make changes. Particularly if you're making major changes, like to a different class of medications. In general, uh, uh, older and bigger children may need more medicine, but not always. Uh, they they are particularly likely to need different types of coverage because they have homework. They have things that go well into the evening when stimulants really are not uh, in play. Um, and puberty um, NB stands for Latin for noto bene, uh, and, and, and puberty is apt to ch change all <laughs> sorts of things, <laughs> including <laughs> symptom presentation, and also may um, may change their response to medication. There are some kids where the pubertal process, there, there's a lot of biologic changes that go on, and um, many of them have the effect of sort of lowering metabolism of, of medication. So even if the kids are getting much bigger, they sometimes actually do just as well on the same dose or even a lower dose uh, than they would have before. Yes, ma'am. Um, how do you, what kind of conversation do you have with the child to convince them to go on the drug? It depends on the age of the child. Uh, what I tend to focus on is not the issue of diagnosis, but the specific behaviors that he, other people have noticed, hopefully he or she has noticed and say, you know, this is an area that's difficulty. We think, we think this, you know, this will be helpful for that. Um, it doesn't always go well. I am still traumatized by one of my first cases when I came here 11 years ago now of an eight-year-old girl who had pretty clear uh, and fairly severe ADHD. And I explained to her that we really thought medicine would be helpful and she broke into tears and, and I was not a happy, <laughs> it was not a happy time, um, and was convinced that if she could just be allowed to chew gum during class, that that would solve all of her problems. Um, softy that I am, I said, well, let's see if we can do that. Um, 
uh, and we did, and it didn't. Uh, but fortunately, in the meantime, one of her best friends also had ADHD and started on medicines, and she discovered that her best friend didn't mind and actually was having a much better time than her before, which changed the whole conversation. So um, what I don't really try to do is to say, you have ADHD, therefore you need to do something, because unfortunately, that then becomes a badge of honor of I've got ADHD, and that explains all of my problems, um, which is not a great position to be in. Also, kids with ADHD tend to be quite impulsive, so they overshare, um, which I loved with my son because <laughs> his brother didn't like it so well, but, but it was very helpful to have information that we wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, but um, so I tend to really focus in on what it is that we're trying to do rather than you got ADHD, so we need to court fix it. Is it trickier than for a child who's just hitting puberty to be just starting for the first time medication? Uh, only in the sense that, I mean, particularly if you're right in the middle of puberty, it may, it may be a little more chaotic. I, it wouldn't prevent me from leaping into it, but yeah, it, it may be a rougher ride. Um, but ultimately, as far as we know, the only group that doesn't really respond well, and this is not the subject of this talk, I'm actually doing another one tomorrow night, but is um, young kids, kids under age five, don't do as well with, with the medicines that we currently have available. They, they have similar responses, but fewer of them respond. They don't respond as robustly, and they have more side effects. Other than that, um, uh, so we, we tend to use ba more behavioral. They're also smaller. so behavioral kind of interventions are a little easier to, it's, it's one thing to work with a four-year-old, it's really quite another to work with a 14 or 15-year-old. Um, all right, we are, the clock is ticking. Um, so uh, I, I have not listed any of the stimulants, they are all on your sheet, um, um, but um, th this, is th this is both stimulants and non-stimulants. What we know is that the medications that have been approved uh, can help with the the key areas of problems with ADHD, which is inattention, distractibility, impulsivity, hyperactivity, that depending on the child, one, of, one or more of those may be worse than the others, um, but um, they may all be present. Um, most of this we've already covered. They, unfortunately, none of the medications we currently have help with executive functioning, learning disabilities, language problems, or social skills. And if those are your targets, they may make it easier for the child to do other things that will help with that, but medicines themselves are not really going to help with any of those areas. Um, and for better or worse, and you can argue it both ways, so far at least the evidence suggests that medication-induced changes are not permanent. Um, there's one study, um, which I don't know what to make of, that has shown that there's a particular area of the brain. Um, one of the interesting things that has come out in the last 10, 15 years, uh, NIA, the, the group at NIMH, studied a kid serially with uh, using um, uh, in, uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, and they found that in general, kids with ADHD are about a year to year and a half behind, um, in particularly forebrain maturation, uh, compared to kids without ADHD. Um, and there's one study that suggests that uh, chronic or consistent use of stimulants may make one of those areas a little more robust than without. Whether that's clini clinically significant or not is anybody's guess. Uh, there's been nothing to suggest that stimulants prevent one from evolving, one's ADHD from evolving however it's going to evolve, which is a very reasonable concern, something that's been looked at pretty carefully. Um, in general, they, they, it's, it's like trying to make, hope that cold medicine will make your cold go away quicker. It's just, it just doesn't seem to happen. All right, so what do we got? Medication options um, uh, are methylphenidate and amphetamine. You've got all of those, um, well, almost all. There's one that's about to come up out, which is interesting. It doesn't have a name yet um, and is not on this sheet uh, because it doesn't have a name yet. Um, but it, it's been approved and will probably be out in the next six months or so. That's actually a night before stimulant. Um, that allegedly you can give 12 hours roughly before the kid is going to wake up, has no activity during the night, uh, begins to work. Um, they imply that there's somehow some magic by which you, <laughs> by which it knows when you wake up, but I'm not sure that that's true. But at any rate, the idea is is that that around the time you wake up, the medicine begins to kick in and is supposed to last about 12 hours um, after that. Um, 
and for families where morning rituals are really a huge problem, that may be uh, that may be a tempting medicine once it's available. And they're working on one that's amphetamine and one that's methylphenidate. So you so you you should be able to have that. And then there's the non-stimulants, which uh, are listed on this, but I'm going to spend a little more time on them uh, because they are different. Um, the stimulants we've already talked; they're very effective. They act very quickly. They can be used selectively, given only when you need them, uh, and they really are. A, a it's a boom industry for the pharmaceutical companies to find new ways to deliver stimulants. Um, you can you can do it in liquid form. You can do it in chew form. You can do it as a patch. I mean, there's all sorts of wonderful ways to get it in you. Um, disadvantages is um, particularly as kids get older, is it only covers a part of the day, and unfortunately, ADHD is not a part of the day kind of disorder. Um, so problems in the morning, problems late in the afternoon or evening. Uh, stimulants are really not likely to be particularly helpful. Um, prescribing is restricted. Uh, that, is, that means that uh, you can't just, as a doctor, call it in and say, do that again. You've got to actually, these days at least we have electronic prescribing, which makes life a little easier, but you can only prescribe a fixed number and you can't do a renewal. Uh, you have to do a new prescription. So it's a little bit of a pain uh, for families and doctors. Um, uh, and in fact, um, that was Lilly's big push when they when they introduced Stratera, which was the first FDA endorsed non-stimulant. Was they were really pushing it to doctors like this is this is just like stimulants, only it's not it's not a controlled substance. The trouble is it wasn't remotely like stimulants, and pediatricians ended up using it very badly, um, and um, it ended up sort of having a brief popularity that waned quickly. Um, we also know what the side effects are, which is neither good nor bad. It's just that we know what they are. Uh, and um, one, of, one of them I didn't mention that I, I should is that if your child is susceptible to, to motor tics or vocal tics, um, probably the most common form is what's called Tourette disorder, which has both mo motor and vocal tics. Um, the stimulants will, will uncover that and make them worse, at least initially. Uh, fortunately, it's a reversible effect when you when you take the, the stimulant away. Uh, not only actually initially, depending on how long they've been on it, you may actually see initial reduction of ticks, and then it sort of comes back to, to where they were before you started meds. And it also, as I, could, as I mentioned earlier, can flatten the personality, and that can actually be a bad enough side effect that parents don't like it and kids don't like it. Um, um, see the handout for the for the forms, and basically, as I said, it just comes in lots. There's lots of different ways to take it, um, uh, and the capsules. If you've got a kid who can't swallow pills or doesn't doesn't choose to, uh, the capsules uh, essentially all can be opened up and and put into something applesauce or yogurt or peanut butter or something, um, so that you can get it in them that way. Um, there is a liquid form, although right now, um, for whatever reason, uh, the manufacturer is having difficulties producing it, so it's it's in short supply at the moment. Um, the patch I don't typically recommend for young kids. It's something that adolescents and adults may want to use. What's nice about it is that it's the only form where you can actually determine how long a day you want to have the stimulant work. Um, you it works about an hour to an hour and a half after you put it on and it stops working about two hours after you take it off. Um, so uh, for particularly late adolescents and adults, that sometimes can produce, um, can be a, a useful effect. All right, non-stimulants. Um, non-stimulants, which there are three that are endorsed, and there's a couple more I'm going to mention that haven't been FDA approved. Um, the main advantage is that they provide 24-hour coverage. That can also be viewed as a disadvantage because to do that, you have to take them every day. So you can't can't take holidays. I, I once had, this is sort of goes back to the um, Stratera being at somebody thinking it was a stimulant, but I had a family come in and say, well, we've done Stratera and it just doesn't, doesn't work. We give it Monday through Friday and we skip the weekends. And I said, well, that's really not the way you use Stratera and that's probably why it's not working. Um, when it's effective, the benefits are really quite comparable in terms of magnitude to those of stimulants. The difficulty is it's only effective about 40 to 45 percent of the time, rather than the 65 percent that we were talking about earlier with stimulants. Also, they, the side effects um, are advantages are, are that uh, the side effects are quite different than the stimulants. Probably the biggest side effect, which can be enough that you can't use it, is uh, that it can be very sedating. 
um, and there's much less of an effect on appetite. Um, so if you've got a kid who can't sleep, for example, it, it's something that, that potentially is usable. And it's easier to prescribe because it's not a controlled substance, so you can do refills and that kind of thing. Uh, I had a question about the uh, stimulants, and uh, you mentioned anxiety as, as, a, as a side effect. Yep. I won't confirm, but it wasn't on that list. Um, how does it affect a, a child who also has anxiety issues? So there, there are two things that can go on. The question was about anxiety and ADHD. So being ADHD um, can make you anxious. Um, for those who need to leave, um, uh, if you would be sure and fill out the, um, the questionnaire on how we did, that would be very useful and appreciated. Uh, and you can just leave it on the table here, or I think there's a table outside. Somebody may tackle you if you try to go with them at the time. Um, um, the, um, so, so Kids with ADHD may be anxious because of their ADHD, and those kids actually end up doing very well with stimulants because people aren't yelling at them all the time, and they aren't constantly doing things that they know they're not supposed to be doing, and they may become much less anxious. Unfortunately, anxiety is also a very common disorder in and of itself, so you may have anxiety and ADHD. You may be blessed with both. And in that case, um, stimulants may make the anxiety worse. And, the, and that becomes really important because uh, you may have a kid whose ADHD actually is better, but you feel like they're worse because their anxiety is then getting in the way. And then that needs to be either, either treated with a second medication or most of the non-stimulants actually help decrease anxiety as well as help with ADHD. So it's a, it's a nice sort of, so, sometimes we can get away with one medicine with a kid like that. Um, before we had these medicines available, typically what we'd do is to add a, a low dose of an antidepressant that would help suppress the, uh, and some of these anxieties are, are really weird. Like the one of the, the strangest ones, which isn't all that common, but is well described, is, is a, insect phobia. So you will have a kid that you put on a stimulant and suddenly they are terrified of, it can be mosquitoes or bees or whatever. Um, and I mean, you'd think, well, that's kind of normal, they're kids, but it's there when they're on the medicine. It's not there when they're off the medicine. It's very clearly a medicine effect. We don't really understand it. Yeah. I heard you talk about taking your kids off during the weekend and holidays. So does that mean that during the week you're just treating your child with medication to get them through school? I'm not sure. So just to get them through school and then on the weekend they're off? I'm not sure. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is it allows them to function well in an environment that's otherwise is too stressful for them and that incapacitates them. Um, and they don't really need it uh, when they're when they're not having to sit still and pay attention to the class and all of that kind of thing. Um, there are a lot of kids where you end up really wanting to give it seven days a week because they, they, they show good benefit. For, um, um, there, there are some kids, for example, who really can't be in sport, team sports without stimulant because they're too disruptive, they're, they're, they're just not gonna function well. So that might be one where you'd wanna, but since we're not fixing anything, my argument would be we use medicine when we when it's causing impairment and we don't use it when it's not causing impairment. Like for our son, he says, Mom, you're doing great. You know, and the teachers are like, okay, he, you know, spaces out sometimes. Right. Um, I mean, I think a lot of us space out sometimes. So, I mean, so I'm going to give him medication just to treat him during school. And when he is perfectly <coughs> fine, I don't understand why. If he's perfectly fine, I would not give him medication. So if you're telling me that off medication, he does just fine. No, we don't even use medication. I'm saying the school is recommending medication. Yeah, quick question while we are on non stimulants So you mentioned uh, sedating effect. Does yeah. it mean continuous kind of drowsy feeling? It can be, yeah. It can, it, so, so it, it can be a good thing and as in it can help them get to sleep at night and it can be a bad thing in that they, so <laughs> there, some of these are worse than others. One is clonidine, which I don't typically use much, but we used to use a lot. Um, one of the first times I used it actually was, was a kid who was in the EB school, EBC school here back in the 80s. And the teacher called me up and said, I've got great news. He's not disruptive at all anymore. Um, the bad news is he's sound asleep um, <laughs> and, and he's not learning much. Um, uh, that's rare. Uh, but for example, you may find that on long car rides, uh, they may may tend to fall asleep, that kind of stuff. Uh, it, it, 
it's usually dose dependent and typically sedation becomes, it's something that they get accustomed to so it becomes less of a problem over time, but it can be severe enough that we have to go to a different kind of medication. So if they probably have groups, is it something like uh, to the effect of they know what they're capable of and then they can control themselves later on without it? Or no, absolutely not that. So, they, so stimulants tend to produce, and this is true in adults as well as kids, and it's not necessarily a good thing. There's a wonderful book, um, that title if nothing else, called On Speed, <laughs> which, is, which is the history of um, the discovery of amphetamine and its many, many uses. Uh, the guy hates ADHD and believe it was invented as a way of selling medications, but aside from that, it's a fascinating book. Um, and one of the things that he does is spend about two chapters on World War II in which the Germans who had a, a patent for um, uh, methamphetamine and the Americans and Briti British folk who had a patent on amphetamine kept trying to demonstrate the wonderful benefits of stimulants for the war effort, um, which largely were none. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things they noticed is that it made people much, much more confident, not necessarily correctly, just that they believed that they were doing better. So they were more likely to charge the same hill over and over again. And in fact, um, one of the statements he asserts is that the Germans used methamphetamine for the soldiers when they blitzed uh, Poland, and they stopped doing it after that because the number of injuries and casualties was much higher than they had anticipated, probably because people were sort of overestimating their abilities and getting into trouble. So. So it, it's, a, it's a little difficult to know whether that's a good or a bad thing. When it's been measured, what it is a perception of being better as opposed to an objective measurement of actually functioning better. Um, and it, it's essentially kind of an overestimate. These medicines don't tend to do that for better or worse. Um, yes, sir. So is this side effect of daytime tiredness and sedation uh, dependent on when the dose is given? Like for instance, if the dose is given at night, um, to some extent, again, it really depends on the kid. Most kids tolerate it or we wouldn't be using it, but um, typically, uh, and, and uh, one of the things like with guanfacine, which is one of the medicines, they created a, medicine, uh, a version of that called Intuna, which is essentially just stretching out. Um, it's, a, it's a wax matrix, that, so it stretches out uh, how the, the drug is, is released over the day so that the level is never as high. And, Sedation is related to, to the, the uh, concentration in the blood. Um, so there are ways around it, potentially. Um, but um, the from it, it's a trade-off. So, so spreading it out during the day is, is one way of dealing with it. Usually, you end up with, with short-acting guanfacine, wanting to do it at least twice a day. With younger kids, sometimes three times a day. Um, and a lot of that is to keep the sedation down while keeping the, the benefit going. Do you find that like if you stack on top of the ADHD, if your child may have other learning disabilities, that once they're on medication, or once they're on the medication, they're being treated well with medication, that it's easier to diagnose the other issues like learning disabilities? Um, with specifically with learning disabilities, I wouldn't say so much because usually those are apparent already. But where, where it can make a huge difference is sort of how willing the child is to do the hard work that's necessary to, to help deal with a learning disability. Um, but I, 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 I can't think of a case where I've had a, I mean, there are some kids who are so, these are rare, who are so ADHD that testing them, you, you, know, you know the answer are not valid because they're just not putting in much effort. Um, so for those kids, yes, maybe maybe additional testing afterwards if there's some question about it. But um, I would say generally um, with, with patients, um, one, one can get a pretty good idea whether or not there are other kinds of things present. Um, anxiety and, and, and ADHD is actually a very interesting problem, particularly with teens, because um, most Many teens, mostly what you're dealing with is inattention and, and distractibility. And I don't know if anybody in this room has ever been anxious. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but um, uh, I have been, so I will raise my hand. Um, anxiety can look very much like ADHD. Um, uh, the big difference is, is that if you've got ADHD, we really think that's probably there since birth, and 
it becomes a matter of sort of when it crosses the threshold of, of, of causing impairment, whereas anxiety is usually something that sort of shows up. It has a different kind of, it shouldn't even say that, it's, it's got a different kind of time course. Um, so anxiety often shows up initially as separation anxiety, problems with you know, not wanting to sleep on your bed by yourself. Um, uh, one of my, uh, uh, Chris Harris, the principal of, of the um, uh, ABC school, actually likes to, 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 to distinguish, he and I do a talk together sometimes. Uh, in fact, we may, I think we're gonna be doing it at the, the Ed Rev conference that I mentioned. Um, the ADHD kid today is the only, pretty much the only thing they're focused on. Uh, my son, for example, uh, there, there was this period of time when every single morning he would wake up saying, wow, I had the worst night's sleep last night, as if he had not said that the previous two weeks before at least, if not more. Um, I mean, it was just like every day, it's, it's Groundhog Day. Um, um, whereas anxious kids are almost never interested in the moment. They're, they're either worried about what they did or didn't do and should have done, or they're worried about what's gonna happen. Um, so sometimes you can sort of make the distinction that way. I it's really helpful. <laughs> Good. <coughs> Will you share referral resources or psychiatric consults as well? Because there's a lot of educational resources, but um, including finding a practice to take your patients. That's really hard for me to share. Um, if you call our, our care managers, uh, which should be number should be somewhere I can give it to you, uh, we do have a list of, of community practitioners. Whether any of them are taking new patients is unfortunately a whole different, I mean, that, that, that despite the fact that we're churning out uh, actually nine residents a year now from Stanford, many of them stay in the area, and four from UCSF every year, uh, most of them get filled very rapidly and fi finding a child psychiatrist is, that's why I, that's why I often suggest starting with a pediatrician if, if it's simple, yeah. Um, as a child ages and the, the taking the stimulant medication, when that wears off and they change, you know, before at dinner time, then they still have activities or homework, right. job or whatever. Is it dangerous then to add additional stimulants? No, it's not dangerous. It's a matter of whether, what the side effects are. So um, it, that's not, it's a fairly common practice to use a short-acting version. Uh, again, if they've got something going on that they, they need, they, they sort of need it. Uh, I actually, the, the extreme example of this was actually the first late adolescent, 18 year old that I ever treated with ADHD. This was before we actually had any kind of an extended release form. And um, th th I was initially quite skeptical because he'd gotten all A's all the way through high school and then he went to college and was getting D's and F's. And um, when I talked to his psychiatry fa psychiatrist father and, and mother, it turned out the reason he'd gotten all A's was because they had created this wonderfully supportive structure for him um, that Got the, and he was very he he was a very go get along kind of guy and it worked out wonderfully. But when he got to college, all of that disappeared. So anyway, um, <laughs> we 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 only had short acting stimulants at the time. He started taking um, he would he would take stimulants starting at four p.m. Th I'm not recommending this. Uh, he started at four p.m. He would take stimulants every two hours because that's about how long they lasted for him until ten. That allowed him to get his homework done. He usually got to bed about one or two in the morning. He never took morning classes. He refused to take stimulants during class because he thought it was a complete waste of a otherwise useful medicine um, and um, went from D's and F's to all A's. So it was hard for me. I, I, I didn't approve of his lifestyle, but it was hard to me for him to argue against his results. Um, um, so, um, it's not dangerous. Um, the, the difficulty can be whether they can get enough sleep. There's some kids where the, the sleep effects really are profound, and that's where we then think about some of the non-stimulants, for example. There's also a medicine, if we, if we can, that I hope to get to, and definitely is in your slides, that I like to use under those circumstances uh, called Welbutrin. Welbutrin is actually an antidepressant that has a dopamine effect. So it's not good for combined type ADHD, but it's great for adolescents who are mostly inattentive, and it provides 24-hour coverage. All right, so I'm not gonna go through this because you've got it in your slides and people are leaving and I feel bad. Um, we got atomoxetine or Stratera, we've got guanfacine, which is 10X, um, uh, and, uh, and Tunif, and uh, we've got clonidine, which um, I'm not sure this is the right use of the word irony, but 
Clonidine was actually the first non-stimulant medication that doctors began to use. It was the last one that the FDA endorsed as useful for ADHD. Um, it's only been out about two or three years, and it, its version is called CAPFE. It's a twice daily extended release version that is supposed to be less sedating, although often it's, it still is too sedating. Um, so, uh, so these are the ones that the FDA has not endorsed, but uh, clinicians have shown uh, in a variety of ways uh, can be very helpful. Uh, one that I really like for teenagers is Welbutrin, um, either by itself or as kind of an augmentation um, with, with hopefully a lower dose of stimulant. Uh, it, it works on the dopamine system, but it's a, you can think of it as a very weak stimulant, but it provides 24-hour coverage. So for, for exactly the kind of thing where you've got somebody who starts his homework, like I did, at 11 at night, um, this, had this been available, I probably would have taken it. I'm not even sure I have ADHD, although some would argue. Uh, at any rate, um, these, are, these are not endorsed by the FDA for treatment of ADHD. They are available and they are, they are accepted by child psychiatry as helpful um, with either clinical experience and, and or research, um, but the, they didn't go through the whole rigmarole that's required to get FDA endorsement. Um, um, there are lots of medicines that we use in child psychiatry that are not endorsed by the FDA for, that u for, for their use in kids because pharmaceutical companies discovered years ago that we're desperate and we'll use anything and so they, they get all the benefit and none of the, none of the cost. Um, one that's kind of interesting uh, and almost got endorsed for, by the FDA, in fact it had a so-called approvable letter, uh, is modafinil or Provigil, uh, uh, which is a, a probably the closest in terms of, of its effects to, um, to stimulants, but has a 24-hour, take 10 once a day and it provides 24-hour coverage. Um, uh, it has uh, the potential for, m maybe, for what's called Stephen Johnson syndrome, which is a very uh, potentially fatal uh, immunologic reaction in your skin. They basically you end up developing antibodies to your skin and your skin fl sloughs off. That's not a good thing. Well, it's thought, to, it's thought to potentially, people who take it may be at increased risk for that. It, how big a risk is, is one of those things that we don't completely understand. There are a number of medicines that can do that, but um, that ended up essentially, they had one case that might have been that, but it was, so it was a very mild case. When the pharmaceutical company took it to the FDA, they said, you know, why don't you do another 3,000 and however many kids they'd done, 5,000 kids, you come back and and the company said, gosh, that's a great idea, but we're not going to do it. So, um, so uh, it's now available generically, and there are, it's, it's actually used off-label for a variety of things. It turns out to be, um, actually, it's very popular in, for the high-stress jobs. So on the Beltway in Washington, D.C., and in Wall Street in New York, it's a very common medicine that, that sort of high achievers use. But it's also used by uh, kids with uh, multiple sclerosis or muscular dystrophy, things that are sort of fatiguing. It provides sort of a, a boost, an energy boost, and it really does help with ADHD. Um, this is modafinil, the one at the bottom. Um, yeah, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, 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 uh, fibromyalgia, things, things where lack of energy, lack of, lack of, um, ability to make it through the day or a, a, a big a big symptom. Um, modafinil seems to be helpful for a variety of those. All right, um, I've already basically said that right now we don't have any major breakthroughs that I'm aware of, um, and I try to follow this pretty closely. Uh, I can tell you the, the search for something that will help with executive functioning is one of the holy grails of psychopharmacology, and if anybody actually finds that, it will, you will not, you will hear about it quite quickly, I'm sure. Um, omega fatty acids um, are being used pretty um, regularly as a supplement. There's certainly no ev evidence that they're harmful. The evidence that they're beneficial specifically uh, to ADHD or any other disorder is, is pretty marginal, but it's probably no difficult, no reason not to. And they're looking at some other, uh, one of the weird things is that child psychiatry probably has more in common with geriatrics than with regular psychiatry. Uh, and a lot of medicines that are used uh, on the geriatric end of things um, for dementia and, and 
other kinds of issues are being looked at in kids in the hopes that maybe one of them will do something useful. So far, I would say that's not been extraordinarily productive, but it is, um, it, it is a source of, of medicines that have at least been tested for safety and efficacy, in, at least in one age group. And um, one of the systems, interestingly enough, is there's a, there are nic so-called nicotinic receptors um, uh, in the brain that, that are particularly dense in the, in the forebrain, and people have been hoping to find a medicine that maybe will that will somehow do something. So far, all of those have really been at best equivocal and certainly haven't risen to the level of, yes, we should be using them. Yes, ma'am. Can we talk about gene site testing? Uh, yeah, so the question is about gene site testing. Uh, I am not a huge fan. Um, it, the, 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 general, the general belief, uh, if, 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 you know, you're all familiar with this, so th this, is, this is actually becoming increasingly popular because we love to have things where we actually have data, even if it doesn't mean anything. Um, uh, and what this does is actually look mostly at, at the metabolic enzymes that are known to be involved in um, uh, getting rid of a variety of medications that we use. And you, it's a very simple DNA swab, or you know, you just I think you spit into a container, um, and they send back this lovely color report that that is has green yellow and red or actually it's orange it's an orangish red um, uh, about whether how likely it is that you're going to have unusual side effects or if it's going to be work well for you uh, has not been studied in kids at all it's barely been studied in adults um, and certainly not with ADHD um, and um, the idea is is that it will help you figure out which medicine you can use or which ones you should avoid. My experience is that it's pretty much 50-50, whether the one that's in contraindicated is going to help or one, certainly I have not found any evidence that it really predicts which, well, you know, what you should use. I don't think it's dangerous if you've, if you've got the $300 you want to spend. I mean, it, it's a little bit of a ripoff for the, the insurance company. Uh, if you pay for it yourself, I think it's $300. If the insurance company pays for it, it's like $1,000. Um, but, you know, it's only money. Yeah. Just quickly, the non-stimulants. Yes. Do they have, we talked a little bit about the side effects, but is one of the side effects not the height side effects? Correct. Yeah, it does not, as far as we know, none of these uh, affect, um, thank you. Uh, now we don't have to chase you down. N none of these, um, um, none of the non-stimulants that we, and they, they haven't been as extensively studied as the stimulants, but none of them have a clear effect on, on height. They also don't affect the effect of stimulants on height. So if you end up on both of them, it's not that that magically prevents you from, but if you can use a lower dose of a stimulant because you're on one of these, that might help to reduce that effect. I do want to emphasize, I, I mentioned the half inch and then I sort of stopped. It's when, when we first made that discovery, the immediate reaction was, wow, a half inch a year in 10 years you're going to be five inches shorter. That does not happen. Um, you would have noticed by now. Um, uh, what, what happens is probably the first two years of somewhere between, compared to, again, compared to ADHD kids who aren't on meds, you end up losing about um, uh, somewhere between a half inch and an inch. And then pretty much that's all, that, that's it from there on. And 10 years later, that, that difference exists. The, the controls are right in between. And in fact, there's no statistically significant difference between the controls and either the unmedicated kids with ADHD or the medicated kids with ADHD. It's, it's the difference between kids so, so it actually helped to solve one of the dilemmas that we had. What, one of the observations years ago was that if you take kids off of um, stimulants during the summer, give them a so-called summer vacation, uh, they often would, quote, catch up height-wise. And uh, what we think is actually happening is they're going back to that growing faster than kids without ADHD. They don't actually catch up probably to where they would have been if they'd never been on stimulants, but they do catch up compared to normal kids. So it seems like the non-stimulant should be the starter, but most medical practitioners just start with stimulant. Uh, yeah, the, the reason, so the com comment is why don't you start with non-stimulants? Um, partly, um, um, the, the stimulants have been around a long time, and pediatricians particularly, who are the, by far the most common prescribers, know them much, much better and feel much more comfortable using them. Um, part of it is 
uh, there's an enormous gratification of actually seeing a kid do better the next day, um, uh, which, which is which is hard, which is which is hard to miss, um, and a lot of kids do very well on just stimulants. I mean, otherwise we wouldn't continue to use them. Um, when Stratera came out, one of the uh, things that Lilly tried to do was to make it a first-line drug, and there are people who make exactly the argument you're saying is we should start everybody on a non-stimulant. If we would, if you happen to own Lilly Soft, that would be Stratera. Um, if you own stock in another company, it would be another drug. But um, and only use stimulants if you know if that doesn't work. Um, th the the, the non-stimulants take longer to work. It, it often can be several weeks before you really see an effect. It's it's sort of subtler. The the response rate is not as high, um, and um, um, and and in some ways, I mean, a lot of parents are understandably this may be the first time they've ever used medicine that's going to affect their brain kids thinking behavior. Um, so the stimulants are sort of easier to get on and off of. Um, um, but there, are, and, and again, there are a lot of, my son, for example, actually didn't start taking stimulants until he was in med school. Um, but, um, um, and, and I would have given him Wellbutrin if I were prescribing for him. His doctor gave him Concerta. Um, and um, he, he still, he actually now, for a long time, he only took it occasionally, but he now takes it regularly, um, and he and he does really well with it. But um, it, it it's it, it's sort of it's just easier, um, and particularly if you've got you know families where that are ambivalent about it, they know they can take them off quickly. Can you talk a little bit about the nuance of what you were just saying? You would have picked Concerta for your son first, but the other doctor. No, no, I I would have picked Wellbutrin. She picked Concerta. Um, I would have picked Wellbutrin because as an adult. And he was a med student. I know what med student lives are like. I think t having 24-hour coverage would have been very nice. Um, for whatever reason, Concerta happens to be her favorite drug. It is It is a local product, by the way. It was developed here in Palo Alto by a company named Dalza. Um, uh, many years ago, it was the first effective, long-acting stimulant and really sort of set that trend. Um, uh, and it's a fine drug. I, I have no objection to it. But it's it's a stimulant, so it only works part of the day. And then, then if you're if you're up all night as a as an intern or med student, uh, you're not going to get much help. All right, we got three questions, and then I'm going to let you guys out of here. As far as the um, using a supplement like um, like the omega threes, mm -hmm. what kind of um, doses would you give? Well, I'd, I'd have to, I'd have to look it up. I, it's one of those things I do not prescribe. It, it, it's the GNC folk will be more than happy to tell you the appropriate dosing. I mean, it, it, it's been looked at. I mean, they, then I just don't remember. It's not it's not one that I prescribe. I mean, it's not a prescription drug. It's it's an over the counter. Uh, given these different classes of medications, are there any that you uh, be especially concerned about for a 16 year old boy learning to drive? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, we do know that ADHD, particularly combined type ADHD, is not um, great for driving. Uh, although, interestingly enough, of my two boys, my ADHD boy, who's really only inattentive, is the better driver of the two. Um, it, it, rather, rather to my surprise. Um, uh, the um, uh, I would want to make sure that if he's on a non-stimulant that he's not so sedated that, that it causes problems. But there's, I wouldn't say any of these are completely contraindicated. If, if, if he gets really sleepy, that's, that's obviously an issue and, and you know, ought to be dealt with. But, um, and, and the other thing, the, the blood pressure issue is, is very rare, but it occasionally does happen. And obviously, you don't want somebody to, although usually when you're sitting, that's not going to be an issue. So it, it shouldn't be an issue. But no, I, I would, the, the short answer is uh, there's there's none that I would pick specifically because of that. Yes, ma'am. You, you're the last, so this better be a really good question. Uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, stimulant uh, medicine does it help sensory issues? No. It doesn't. We don't have medicines for sensory issues either. In fact, it's worse than that. Psychiatry doesn't believe that kids have sensory issues, which is. Insane, but nonetheless true. Um, uh, but there's no evidence that um, kids who have hypersensitivity to touch or smell or any of that kind of stuff 
uh, really change the way, change in that, that regard with any of the medicines that we currently have available. It's another, it's another area that needs to be dealt with behaviorally rather than, than with meds. Um, all right, thank you all for your patience. <laughs>